everyone. Welcome back to another week of the Triple Play. This is Danielle. Uh, this week, Vols had a really tough game against uh, Missouri. Looked very promising at the beginning. Didn't turn out that way towards the end, but we're going to talk about that. Uh, take a look around the SEC. Not much happened this weekend. Only um, three interconference games. So we'll look at those, look at the NFL. But I'm joined by Sam this week. So let's just go ahead and get started. Like I said, tough loss for the Vols. They lost to Missouri 29-21. Uh, to 21. Uh, The Vols are now 5-6 and six on the season, 2-5 and five in the SEC, putting Mizzou at 9-2, and 6-1 and one in the SEC. This was their 10th straight road win, which is just insane to think about. But uh, like I said, tough game for the Vols. Josh Dobbs, everybody was thinking that he's going to come out and like be the savior this week. He still had a really strong performance, uh, 24 for 37, 195 yards, one touchdown, one interception, but he was sacked six times, which is really tough to kind of comprehend, but 17 carries whenever he's rushing the ball thir for 13 yards, no touchdowns there. Uh, I think just the story of the game, whenever you look back at it, is just Mizzou's defense, their rush defense especially was incredible against the Vols. Yeah, I mean, the front four for Missouri is definitely their strong suit. Um, you know, their secondary is not necessarily the strongest. The front four and the front seven are what make the impact for them. And really, for me, the big takeaways on this game were five things. Dobbs didn't play as well as he did. He still played pretty strong mm -hmm. for the most part, but we saw him make the mistakes that he hasn't made. A large part of that is due to the bad play of the offensive line. The offensive line got beat up. Yes, they were playing a really good front front four. And this is the best defense we've faced since Dobbs has come in. Mm -hmm. So I think it showed you a little bit more realistically what Dobbs is really going to be like, um, at least at this point in his career. Uh, the O-line got beat up. Dobbs helped cover up a lot of the mistakes the O-line had, a lot of their issues that we saw. Worley, without being able to run, it was more visible to everybody. Dobbs couldn't cover that up this time. Wide receivers dropped the ball numerous times. Hurd wasn't able to get a lot of holes opened up for him. He only had 40 rushing yards and... 11 didn't. carries. Yeah, 11 carries, 40 yards. Didn't re He got six catches for 40 yards, so his numbers were down in every, every category. He's been breaking off big runs. His longest run was only 17 yards. So, I mean, it was that, and you just you had mistakes. We didn't make a lot of penalties. We were only penalized four. Let's see, where was it? Four times. I'm sorry, five, five times, times for, 40 for 40 yards. yards. But each time we got called for a penalty, it was in a crucial situation. And we had some fundamental breakdowns. The defense got worn out and gave up more big plays yet again. Um, going back to uh, the rush defense that I was talking about with Mizzou, like you said, Hurd was um, contained only 11 carries for 40 yards, but. Just the way that, I mean, like, yeah, their rush defense was really strong, like I said, but just the way that they were able to contain our offense in general. Um, I mean, our going back to the rushing, like I was talking about, 53 rushing yards total for the Vols. Uh, whenever it comes to passing, 226 total there. Um, not too bad. Those are kind of the numbers we've been used to seeing. But for the total yards for the Vols to just be 279, whenever you combine that rush and the passing, it's just kind of hard to believe with 18 first downs as well. Um, offense just, I hate to say that they looked slow, but they did. Like I said, they were definitely contained by the defense. But um, looking over at Mizzou real quick, Matty Mock, like I talked about on the show last week, he was going to be the nucleus for this team. However, he played would be, would reflect onto the team. 12 for 25, 230 yards, two touchdowns, both came in the uh, fourth quarter. Uh, towards the beginning and middle of the fourth quarter there, but um, crucial timing for those uh, scores and uh, Marcus Murphy kind of came out of nowhere almost uh, in this game. I know most people that I talked to were really looking for Russell Hansborough to have a really big day, but Marcus Murphy, 19 carries, 82 yards, two touchdowns there for him. Uh, Russell Hansborough, 15 carries, 68 yards. The two of them were just dynamic for this game. It was incredible yeah. to watch. Uh, but I think what everybody is talking about with this game, um, of course. The fake kick that we had turned into a touchdown from uh, two players who were both walk-ons, which just blew my mind whenever I thought about it because I saw them on the field. I'm like, this looks unusual. And then, I mean, I don't think anybody was expecting that fake kick to happen. It was beautiful. It was a 31-yard pass from Alex, Alec Alex Ellis to uh, Patrick Asford. Uh, it was just incredible. Not going to lie. 
Oh. Great to see. And that put the balls up 10 to 7 at that point in the game. Uh, that, 11, four, that was 11 minutes and 14 second mark of the second quarter, I believe it was. It was a great play, and I don't remember where I heard it. But uh, I saw it somewhere. That's the first time we've run that play since the Missouri game last year. Mm -hmm. So we've done it to Missouri twice. But, um, I mean, yeah, great play, like you said. It definitely was a spark. Tennessee showed glimpses of the offense getting going. They showed sparks. I mean, Evan Berry had several big returns on kickoffs. I and The big thing for me, you know, the defense overall, I think they played pretty decent the majority of the game. They gave up the big plays at the end, but I think they got a little – gas towards the end of the game, but Tennessee could not take advantage of the opportunities. I mean, to me, the real MVP of this game goes to the special teams. It's Matt Dar. Matt Dar had a, has had a heck of a season. If he doesn't, if he doesn't win some national award or isn't the best, you know, punter of the year in the SEC with his statistics, something's honestly wrong in my opinion. I mean, he pinned him deep multiple times and Tennessee just couldn't take advantage of it on either sides of the ball. So when you get that kind of, you know, opportunity from your punter, you have to take advantage of it, and Tennessee could. Speaking about special teams, another big point that everybody's talking about was late in the game uh, whenever the Vols had finally gotten the score down to 29-21, uh, only an eight-point deficit. But a minute 52 left in the fourth. Uh, Dobbs threw a touchdown to Kroom. Uh, Two-point conversion ended up being good there, putting us down by eight. Uh, then came the back-to-back -back onside kicks that kind of shook the nation, I guess you could say, or we could say the SEC nation since they were here that morning. But uh, there was the onside kick. UT did recover it, but then there was the offsides call. And most people are really confused by this. They've looked at the play tape numerous times, and it looks like everybody is in line. But if you look at the picture, it does look that Aaron Medley is, above, is over the ball, so that is where the offsides penalty came in. People are really confused on why this happened, like what the reasoning is behind it. But as said on, uh, on like during the game with the audio between Kirk Herb Street and um, one of the officials that they had in the booth, the offsides call could not be reviewed, but there was the illegal touch by Missouri. So whenever that illegal touch was shown, then there ended up being that the five-yard penalty would come in with a re-kick. That's where the offsides penalty would come in. So five yards back onto the re-kick, and then they go for another onside kick. The ball was recovered by UT, but there was an illegal touch call on the Vols for not going 10 yards. I, I want to say it only went like eight and a half to nine yards, Jeez. almost to the 10, but his feet were behind the line, but the ball just did not yeah. get past the plane. And that's another one where at least I know I heard a lot of people confused upon two with – saying his feet were 10 yards. Yeah, he was behind the 40. But the ball, the ball was, was about nine. And it doesn't matter in that situation. It's not mm -hmm. a goal line play where it matters where the ball, right? you know, where they were. If it was mm -hmm. out of bounds, it's all about where the ball is like it is with right. the goal line. The player doesn't have to cross the goal line mm -hmm. as long as the ball does. The ball has to go 10 yards in this right. situation. And he, he was behind the 40, but the ball was about nine, maybe nine and a half. But... You can't blame him for going for it there. If he had waited another second, who knows if we got the ball there or not. Yeah, it was definitely a tough place there. Um, but you do have to commend the uh, special teams unit for those two plays. On, um, onside kicks are never easy, especially in the SEC. But to have – they were really strong attempts, not going to lie. The first one looked really good. Um, I know that uh, all the students, all the fans, just kneeling got really um, – there was so much elect electricity in Neyland after that first uh, onside kick, and then it kind of just ruined. It went really somber after the second. But uh, overall, good game for the Vols. We were heavily we were hev heavily favored going into the game. Everybody on SEC Nation picked the Vols to win. Uh, from what I heard, Lee Corso picked the Vols to win as well. Yeah. That's pretty exciting there for the Vols. But I mean, going against a team that's twentieth in the nation, uh, it was a really good performance for the Vols. Unfortunately, just things. Didn't work out in the fourth quarter, but uh, looking ahead now to this weekend, we play Vanderbilt in Nashville. Uh, Vandy is 3-8 and eight on the season. They still haven't found a win in the SEC. They're still looking for that one. But uh, everybody's been joking, saying this is just going to be a cakewalk for the Vols. But there is going to be a reason to worry about Vandy. Most people would just laugh at me for saying that. But, I mean, we're coming into a situation where we could – I mean, we've lost to them two years in a row. 
granted things have changed. They had better teams back then. They had a better coach, but you can't, you can't just overlook Vanderbilt. You can't overlook any team in the SEC, even though Vanderbilt has been laughed at almost all season. But uh, it's just going to be a really exciting game for the Vols, I think. There's a lot of potential going into this game. We could see a lot of um, really high notes from this team, especially from the offense. Um, it's still just going to be interesting to see like how the defense can play. I mean, of course, with everything that's been going on um, outside of the team, I mean, with A.J. Johnson being suspended, um, key player there for the defense uh, with everything that's been going on there with the allegations. But um, it's just going to be interesting to see how the defense plays against a team like Vandy. I mean, like I said, people have just kind of looked at Vandy as being the laughing stock, but they can turn around in the blink of an eye. I mean, we've seen Arkansas do it. Arkansas was struggling for the longest time, and now they've had two back-to-back -back wins, shutouts as well against uh, ranked teams. But we're going to talk about that later in the show. But it's just there's something we just have to keep our eye out for Vanderbilt this weekend. Yeah, I mean, Vandy, Vandy's got a lot of good players. It's obviously with the coaching change, we expect them to have a down year um, with Franklin leaving and Derek Mason coming in. But this is a dangerous team. I'm with you. I'm not chalking this one up no. as a win. That's why I said it's so important to beat Missouri. It's at home. You are you go to Vanderbilt. Obviously, I mean, it's not the most intimidating place in the SEC by far. It's a high school stadium compared to most other places in the SEC. But you have the situation of Vandy has nothing to play for. Their season's done. You have mm -hmm. a senior class that's used to winning for a change. You have mm -hmm. a team that's used to winning, used to going to bowl games. Their season's over. Tennessee right. is their bowl game. It's like when we used to play Kentucky at the mm -hmm. end of the year when we had the big winning streak. They would make shirts and sell shirts, Tennessee versus Kentucky. It was their bowl game. Right. Vanderbilt's coming out to spoil. Mm -hmm. All the pressure's on us. You win, go to a bowl game. Yeah, maybe not as good as it would have been if you beat Missouri, mm -hmm. but it's a bowl game is still a bowl game. Right. It's great for this young team. We're still young. You need the extra practice time you get with the ball. And this is an opportunity for Tennessee to get back to where people mm -hmm. were thinking they were after the win against Kentucky. People Definitely. were already starting to say Tennessee's the favorite to win the East in 2015. Mm -hmm. It's still way too early to start saying that. The game last or the game Saturday proved that against Missouri. Mm -hmm. We're not necessarily that good to be able to say Tennessee's easily the favorite to win the East next year. But they can get back on the road to doing that with a strong showing against Vanderbilt. Um, an impressive win. Getting three wins in the SEC is something we haven't done in a while. That's crucial to get to. And you want to control the state. We have several big recruits that are in the Nashville area that we're competing with. Uh, other schools in the SEC, Old Miss and other places like that, for winning in Vanderbilt would be a great thing. You want to win the state. You want to get three wins in the SEC play, SEC play and go to a bowl game. But this is not going to be a cakewalk. Tennessee opens up with a 17, the line's 17 for Tennessee. But I expect this to be a close game. Vandy always plays as tough. Is a mm -hmm. It may be a lower-level rivalry game, but it's still a rivalry game for a reason. Mm -hmm. Rivalry games never go as anyone expects them to. Yeah, and looking at what Vanderbilt went against this weekend, it was, it was an embarrassment for them. Just going to go ahead and put that word out there. I know that's... I, it's not the word I want to use, but it was embarrassing for them. They lost 51 nothing to Mississippi State, but, I mean, it is Mississippi State. They were looking to bounce back after losing to Bama last week, 25-20. They they did just that. They just completely dominated. Uh, Dak Prescott, 16 for 21, 193 yards with three touchdowns there. And just looking at the total yards, Mississippi State, oh, they went – they – doubled and more um, what Vanderbilt had. Vandy had 228 total yards, Mississippi State 502. And just looking at their rushing game, uh, just the rushing numbers, it kind of just sets the tone for the game. Vanderbilt 49 rushing yards while Mississippi State had 283. Um, I mean, going into that game, everybody looked for Mississippi State to just dominate. They did just that. Um, I mean, they've been great this season. Mississippi State has had a dream season. The whole state of Mississippi has pretty much had a dream season. Well, but, um, I mean, Vanderbilt, it was just a tough weekend for them. Yeah. Well, and Mississippi State did one thing that – Vandy's had one key player on offense. We mm -hmm. all know about the quarterback struggles. Okay, they played three different quarterbacks mm -hmm. yesterday. Obviously, it was – or Saturday, sorry. Obviously, it was a blowout, so you're going to play more quarterbacks. But Ralph Webb has been the bright spot of that struggling Vandy offense all year. If he had, he needed around 100 yards to stay on pace with them not going to a ball game for a 1,000-yard season, 
They held him to 14 yards on 11 carries. He averaged 1.3. Mm-hmm. He's gotten explosive runs all year. His longest run was only for six yards. And that's something Tennessee's going to have to do. Mm-hmm. They're going to have to shut down Ralph Webb. Mississippi State did that. And with the way Vandy's played offensively, if you shut down Ralph Webb, there goes their offense. Mm-hmm. And, I mean, let's face it, out, Bama shut down Mississippi State, but Bama is a top four team in the country. You know, mm-hmm. they have it. College football playoff committee has it right in my mind with them being the number one team right now. Of course, we'll see how that changes this week. But Mississippi State is definitely worthy of being a top four team. And, you know, you kind of feel bad for Vanderbilt in a way. Kind of feel bad for anybody mm-hmm. when they get 50-something points put up on them. But kind of knew it was going to happen coming in, mm-hmm. especially with Mississippi State losing. Yeah. And this weekend, the game will be at 4 o'clock on Saturday um, on the SEC Network. So uh, we'll definitely be looking forward to that, see how the balls do. Um, I mean, it's going to be an interesting game. If we win, we're bowl eligible, first time since 2010. So uh, I know that the balls are definitely looking for some uh, postseason play there. But looking around at some other games in the SEC, the other intercollegiate or the other interconference game, I should say, was between Arkansas and Ole Miss, and Arkansas just shut out Ole Miss 30 to zero. I don't think anybody was really expecting this. I mean, last week Arkansas did shut out LSU 17 to nothing, but um, this also was the first. Arkansas is the first unranked team to shut out ranked teams in back-to-back games, so um, that's really good for them. I know they were struggling at the beginning of this season. Uh, I mean, they're six and five overall, two and five in the SEC. So to have two back-to-back wins in the conference. Uh, not only against the ranked teams like I talked about, but um, definitely like two really strong teams in the conference uh, is really impressive for them. Uh, Arkansas's defense was stellar in this game. Six forced turnovers against the Rebels, which, uh, I mean, that's that was kind of unheard of at the beginning of the season oh, yeah. with an uh, offense like Ole Miss. But looking at Bo Wallace's numbers, they – Yardage was really good, 16 for 31, uh, 235 yards, but he did have two interceptions there. So, um, I mean, Bo Walsh has kind of been up and down for a while. But, I mean, like I said, Ole Miss started off their season really strong. But you just kind of help. You can't. You kind of can't help but think that they've really struggled since their loss against um, LSU back in uh, late October. I always say it was like October 25th. Yeah. Um, they lost 10 to seven that day. But since that loss, I mean, they lost to LSU, then they lost to Auburn the next week, beat Presbyterian uh, in a shutout there, 48 to nothing, and then lost to Arkansas. So it just makes you wonder if their hype, I guess you could say, quote unquote hype, is finally going down. Um, it just, I feel like the morale for the team's kind of gone down a little bit. But, I mean, Bo Wallace is still Bo Wallace. Yeah. I mean, he, this just this season, he's put up 2,000, over 2,000 yards. I want to say, like, almost 2,800 yards. So, um, I mean, it's just, I think some most people weren't expecting this to happen with Ole Miss. But once you get that one loss, it's, it's going to make or break you. Yeah, I mean, he's, he's definitely one of the elite quarterbacks, not only in the SEC, but in the country. Mm-hmm. But, I mean, when you look at the stats for this game, I mean, it's close. The score does not look at all like what it should. I mean, it was Arkansas got 17 first downs. Mm-hmm. Ole Miss had 19. Both mm-hmm. teams were horrendous in third down efficiency. I mean, total yards, Mississippi had 316. Arkansas had 311. It was the six turnovers that did it. Mm-hmm. Ole Miss did themselves in. And, I mean, this is an Arkansas team that's getting hot. It's our, you know, you can say Brett Bielema definitely has them ahead of schedule mm-hmm. with where they should be in just his second year. I mean, you look at the future's bright for both Tennessee and Arkansas. They're really ahead of where they should be at this point in the new coaching regime of the two head coaches. And, I mean, they're both programs that were definitely competing. Mm-hmm. They were favored every year in their side of the conference. They both dropped down had a ton of hard luck. I mean, the thing here for Arkansas, they went, what was it, 16 straight SEC games without mm-hmm. a win. Back 17, back, I believe 17, it was. 17 back-to-back wins in the SEC now over two ranked teams, and they shut them both out. I mean, it's. It, I think it's all starting to click for Arkansas. And if this mm-hmm. is the real Arkansas, we're going to start seeing the, the West just got even tougher, which is hard mm-hmm. to imagine, but then they got even tougher. And for Ole Miss, you know, they've had injuries, and the offense goes up and down with Bo Wallace. Mm-hmm. So when the defense doesn't play well and Bo Wallace doesn't play well, Ole Miss is in a really, really tough spot. But it's one of those games. You do got to wonder, can they keep it together and can they pull an upset Mm -hmm. in the Egg Bowl this week against Mississippi State? Or does State just come in and take over 
the state of Mississippi. Right. It'll be really interesting. This weekend um, should be really exciting in comparison to this weekend we just had, but week 13 is always known for being kind of a slow weekend in college football. But looking at the other games in the SEC, pretty low-key day. I mean, games kind of went as expected. Uh, Florida beat Eastern Kentucky 52-3. to Georgia beat Charleston Southern uh, 55-9. to South Carolina beat South Alabama 37-12. to uh, Auburn beat Samford 31 to 7. Alabama beat Western Carolina 48 to 14. So I mean, everybody else was kind of was playing those FBS teams. I know there was a lot of talk this weekend about um, if it's right for uh, like for teams that are like so prestigious in college football to play against F- uh, FCS teams. That, or, yeah, yeah, FCS. yeah, FCS teams. My bad. Um, to play against those. So I mean, still a lot of talk there. But I mean, overall SEC, everything went as expected this weekend. But uh, looking over at the rest of college football, same thing can be said for uh, the rest of the games. It was pretty. It was a pretty slow weekend. Uh, Oregon beat Colorado 44-10. Florida State still finding a way to just rally and squeak I by teams. And I don't... This, it's, it's, this is probably like the fifth or sixth week in a row, and it's just it's getting kind of weird. But, um, I mean, it was a late field goal for Florida State to help them uh, beat... Boston College 20 to 17. If Boston College could have won that game, that would have been one of the best upsets, uh, in my opinion. Oh, definitely. Uh, I mean, Boston College three and four in the ACC, six and five overall. Florida State still undefeated. Um, looking at some other games, Ohio State beat Indiana 42 to 27. Baylor beat uh, Oklahoma State 49 to 28. UCLA beat USC 38 to 20. Uh, really good game right there. Uh, I know that Hunley had uh, four touchdowns for uh, UCLA, so that was really interesting. Um, Michigan State beat Rutgers 45 to three, just really dominant right there. Uh, Arizona State beat Washington State 55 30, 52 to 31. I'm sorry. Arizona beat Utah 42 to 10. Really close one between uh, Wisconsin and Iowa 26 to 24 with Wisconsin edging out. Um, the Hawkeyes there. Uh, Oklahoma beat Kansas 44-7. Minnesota uh, upset Nebraska. I guess you could call it an upset. They were both really low in the AP, but 28-24 there. Good win for Minnesota. Uh, Clemson shut out Georgia State 28-10. Georgia State is now 1-10 on the season. Um, That's just kind of hard to believe right there for them. But um, I'm still getting used to being in the the big league. Well, I hate to say the Sun Belt being a big league, Mm -hmm. but coming up from... You know, the uh, FCS. Definitely. Still seeing used to it. Yeah. And struggling. Then, yeah. Yeah, definitely, yeah. And uh, Louisville beat Notre Dame 31-28. to Close one there. Uh, that would have been a really solid win for Notre Dame if they would have won. But I know that um, there was a – it was a really late missed field goal um, for Notre Dame. But a uh, good win there for Louisville. They're 24th in the nation right now. But – uh, like I said, nothing too big happened uh, this weekend. In my opinion, I think the Minnesota-Nebraska game was probably the most exciting. But, um, I mean, the Gophers just rallied there, and that's a really good win for them. But looking at the college football playoff scenarios right now, um, the new standings will come out tomorrow night, Tuesday night at 7. So uh, we'll be looking for those. But just going out of what happened this weekend, I don't see the top four changing at all. Should um, Right now, if it were to happen today, it would be Bama going against Mississippi State. And Oregon playing Florida State. So I think that those are two really good matchups right there. Who would win? I still don't know. I feel like these four teams are really strong, but I would give Bama the edge um, if these four teams were playing. Fifth and sixth as of last week, TCU at number five, Ohio State at number six. Um, I would love for TCU to get back in that top four position somewhere. Um, I just think they're kind of a dark horse in the nation right now. They, they're really exciting to watch, in my opinion. Oh. But, I mean, if it were to happen today, those four teams, I just – I feel like Bama would have the would have the upper hand. I would have to give it to Bama. I think – and it's been said throughout the last couple of weeks, Bama's the most complete team out there. I really do. I think that they may not be the most explosive at times, which has hurt them on the offensive side of the ball. But as far as being complete, I think they're the most complete. I will give you a team that could mess everything up, though, and get TCU back in the mm-hmm. top four. That's Arizona. Absolutely. I mean, Arizona, mm-hmm. they can wind up potentially making a push for the top four themselves. And I, that would have been a little bit more viable before they had uh, their loss last week because they ranked 15th now instead of being in the top 10. 
But I would not be surprised after they dismantled 17th ranked Utah to see them slide back up closer to the top 10. Uh, you know, if they can, I don't know off the top of my head what the Pac 12 standings are, but if they can get a hold of mm-hmm. Oregon, they can completely Absolutely. derail Oregon's season. I mean, mm-hmm. Nick Williams against mm-hmm. a tough Utah defense, 20 carries, 218 yards, three touchdowns, had a 75 yard run. He almost single handedly for the Wildcats. Just destroyed Utah. I mean, Arizona is a team that is in the right position in the polls to be able to at least mess things up for Oregon and change the outlook of the college football playoff. And another team you've got to look at is 12th ranked Kansas State. They won a nail biter on Thursday night against West Virginia, 26 to 20. But K State's in that just outside the top 10 range from the Big 12. They're still there where they could potentially mess a few things up for some teams, but we'll just have to see. And um, looking over at the Heisman watch really quick, um, it is coming up to that point in the season, but um, according to ESPN's Heisman watch right now, it's top five, Marcus Mariota, Melvin Gordon, Amore Cooper, Trevon Boykin, and uh, Dak Prescott. I mean, not really surprised by any of these choices. Three quarterbacks, a wide receiver, and a running back. All five of these players are really strong. I mean, Marcus Mariota has pretty much been at the top the whole season. Um, So out of these five, I don't really think there's a bad choice with the Heisman. But, I mean, there's still a whole other week to go. And a lot can happen in that time. But, I mean, Marcus Mariota has had the upper hand all season. But I just, I look at the list and Amari Cooper, I just feel like if anybody could be the surprise choice, it could be him. I mean, yes, he is the wide receiver for Alabama. He has been just – he's been stellar all season. But, I mean, I would put my two between – my two top picks would be Amari Cooper and Marcus Mariota, but anything is possible at this point. I would have said Cooper mm-hmm. up until Saturday when he got hurt. That and is And you true. don't know how that injury is going to affect him. And it shouldn't. I mean, right. realistically, you should look at what he did over the whole season. Right. Yeah, I don't – care if the guy went out in week seven. If he put Mm -hmm. up numbers that's unheard of, he should still be considered for the Heisman Trophy. But realistically, unfortunately, in the real world with the Mm -hmm. people who get to vote for the Heisman, if you get hurt Mm -hmm. at the end of the season, it tends to cost you a Heisman Trophy. You know, so I don't, who knows how that's going to happen, how that affects it. You know, Prescott, Mm -hmm. I still think, is is a top contender for it, especially if he can somehow get into an SEC championship game. Mm -hmm. Um, But you do. You still have to wonder what Cooper's going to bring. Mariota's definitely the front runner. Mm -hmm. But, you know, running backs have had a way of finding a way to win the Heisman, and Gordon has been on a tear this year for Wisconsin. Mm -hmm. I mean, in a year of disappointment for the Big Ten, he's probably been the bright spot for the entire conference. Mm -hmm. So you've got to take that into some account. Yeah, and definitely. And going back to Cooper, quick note on that, it was just – Nick Saban said that it was just a bruised knee and he could have came back into the game. So, I mean, I don't really see it being that big of an issue um, with uh, that inter- that injury. Um, helmet to the knee, pretty serious right there. But, I mean, um, definitely I still think there's a chance that he could still be really strong to finish out the season exactly. whenever they play against Auburn. So it'll be really interesting this Saturday for that game. But um, going over to the NFL – the Broncos, I don't know how they did it. <laughs> Gotta be honest, I really, I called my mom last night um, towards the end of the game because I was missing it. She told me that um, that the Dolphins were winning. I thought, okay, that's weird. Um, but I mean, the Broncos have just struggled as of late, which is hard to believe. But somehow they rallied, beat Miami 39 to 36. Peyton 28 for 35, 257 yards. Four touchdowns, no interceptions. What blows my mind is how him and Demarius Thomas have found a way to just mesh together. And it's just, it's beautiful, to be quite honest. Oh, Three is. of those touchdowns went to Demarius Thomas. And, I mean, since Peyton broke the record, Demarius has become his go-to guy. I mean, that's he's the guy who caught the um, record-breaking, well, yeah, the record-breaking uh, touchdown. And, I mean, since then, he's just been right there for Peyton. But uh, C.J. Anderson... Uh, for the Broncos, 27 carries, 170, 167 yards, I'm sorry, and one touchdown there. But uh, another uh, cool little note to look at is how equal the offense was for Denver. 35 uh, passes and 35 rushes. So that equilibrium was uh, something that was expected with the Broncos this week. 
Um, just really exciting to see, but somehow Denver just pulled out that win. Yeah. Well, and you've got to look at, I mean, you know, obviously you can say there's a Peyton Manning factor. Mm-hmm. Peyton definitely did start off slow. He played better at the end of the mm-hmm. game. I mean, you've got to be impressed with Anderson. I mean, everyone expected, you know, Monty Ball to carry it away. Mm-hmm. Obviously he got hurt. Then you have Ronnie Hillman get hurt. Yeah. But, I mean, Anderson, he started the year, I think, as the four-string running back. Mm-hmm. I mean, come out and do this. I mean, you, you can now look at he's pushed Hillman out of the pitcher, and they found their second back to go with uh, Monty, you know, go ball when he comes mm-hmm. back. But it's amazing. You look at all the wide receivers and all the weapons Peyton has. Mm-hmm. I mean, we haven't seen uh, Julius Thomas be mm-hmm. as – effective the last couple of weeks. Obviously, we know what Demarius has done. Mm-hmm. And I think he's been his, Peyton's favorite target since he got there. Definitely. Um, Welker has almost been quiet as could be this year. Mm-hmm. I mean, who would have thought Wes Welker wouldn't have hardly anything after the role he played in that team last year? But how about Emmanuel Sanders? Yeah. I mean, he may not have caught the touchdown passes. He's been really strong But for nine them. catches for 125 yards. Mm-hmm. I, you know, yeah, I didn't have the touchdowns, but I mean, arguably, that's been Peyton's second favorite all target right. all year long. And, He's a younger version of Wes Welker who can mm-hmm. actually do more and has a little bit better size and speed. So, I mean, I'm excited to see what Peyton can do with Emmanuel Sanders because mm-hmm. you've got to wonder, you're going to get to that point in the season, you have to decide between the two Thomases. Who do you keep? Mm-hmm. Who do you get rid of? You probably can't keep them both. How much longer is Peyton going to play? Because that determines how much longer you're, you're invested in competing for a Super Bowl versus rebuilding. So you can see Sanders take an even bigger role. Because right. having Sanders and the ability he's had, plus the young talent, still having Welker at a high level for a year, two mm-hmm. years, maybe more, could make Demarius the more expendable option. Yeah. Because you don't really have that thread tied in behind Thomas. But we'll see what happens. Definitely. And going on to another game, Titans are still just struggling. They just can't find a way to click. Um, they had a really close game against Pittsburgh last week. Um I know for me it was very tough to watch. I really thought the Titans were going to win it, but somehow the Steelers just pulled out that win. But um, they did not find redemption this week against Philadelphia. Uh, they lost to the Eagles 43-24. to Zach Mettenberger, 20 for 39, 345 yards, two touchdowns, and one interception. But, I mean, the Eagles just had... Uh, the advantage the entire game. They took an early lead with a 107-yard kickoff return uh, to start that game um, and just never gave up a lead. And uh, LaShawn McCoy uh, for Philadelphia, he's been a big name all season. Oh, yeah. Uh, 21 carries, 130 yards. Uh, And it is is important to be noted that Philadelphia had 164 rushing yards total. So, I mean, LaShawn McCoy... 130 of those yards were his, so that's just... 34 yards, everyone else? Yeah. And 25 of those belong to Sproles, for exactly. that matter. So, I mean, it's... You know, the Eagles... I mean, I hate it. I'm a Giants. Mm-hmm. I, li- I like the Giants. That's my favorite team along with the Broncos. Yeah, I know. It's weird. <laughs> Two NFL teams. But uh, <laughs> I hate the Eagles, mm-hmm. just because I'm a Giants fan. We all know how thick that rivalry is. Mm-hmm. But... I mean, Mark Sanchez. I said it when he was in New York as a Jet. I said it was more about the system and the coaches he had there than his ability to play. I said, you know, if he goes, he's one of those quarterbacks. If he goes somewhere and he gets that second opportunity, mm-hmm. he's going to make the most of it. He's going to prove everybody wrong. I mean, oh, Sunday wasn't his best game. He did throw two picks, but he still went 30 for 43 mm-hmm. with 307 yards. And a Mark's, touchdown. And so. a touchdown, yeah. Mark Sanchez has got this team playing maybe better than they did beforehand and yeah. you have to wonder has Sanchez all of a sudden become the guy even though Nick Foles only mm-hmm. lost his job due to injury mm-hmm. we've seen it we see it all the time a guy loses his job to injury and never gets it back I mean this is going to be an interesting spot for Philadelphia what did they what did they do with their quarterback situation at the end of the year mm-hmm. it's a different situation than the Titans have but they're going to have a similar situation choosing between do we go ahead and make Menberger the guy of the future get him ready say locker doesn't work and what do you do, Blocker? Can you mm-hmm. cut him? Can you trade him? Who in the world wants him? Probably he's going to be. He's going to have to go somewhere as a backup mm-hmm. rather than a starter right off the bat. But two teams with interesting quarterback plays. Definitely not the quarterbacks you thought would be starting this game at the end of the season. And neither one of them really played bad. Neither one of them really played that great. Right. It was all spotty. Mm-hmm. But the Titans, they're so close to putting it together. They've got so many pieces. Obviously, they're in the first year of Wiz and Hunt mm-hmm. as the head coach. But, I mean, when you look at the weapons they have, quarterback's obviously a question, but you have Bishop Sankey. You have Green. You have McCluster, who's 
a threat to go off at any point. So they're just questioned. Definitely. Um, looking at other games in the NFL, Thursday night, uh, the Raiders beat the Chiefs twenty-four to ten to find or twenty-four to twenty. I'm sorry to finally get their first one of the season. They're now one and ten, one and five at home. Uh, other games from yesterday, uh, the Browns beat the Falcons in a close one, 26-24 uh, in Atlanta. Patriots dominated the Lions, another big game for the Patriots, 34-9. Uh, to nine. Uh, Tom Brady, three, he was 38 for 53, 349 yards and two touchdowns there. Uh, Packers had a close one against the Vikings, 24-21 there with uh, the Packers getting the edge. The Colts... Uh, Really dominated the Jaguars 23 to 20, uh, and in Indianapolis with Andrew Luck throwing one touchdown with 253 yards, so not too bad right there for him. Uh, Bengals beat the Texans 22 to 13. Uh, the Jets and Bills game this was really interesting. It got it got postponed. Um, there's been a lot of bad weather up in Buffalo. Uh, most people were looking for this game to be postponed, but um, I mean just looking at it, I think most people would have picked the Bills to win. Um, I mean, home game, they're 5-2 and two on the season. The Jets are 2-8, and eight, but that would have been a really interesting game to um, have seen. Uh, Bears beat the Buccaneers 21-13. to 13. Seahawks beat the Cardinals 19-3. to 3. Chargers had a close one against St. Louis, 27-24, uh, to uh, with the Chargers um, surviving with a late... I, or no, they survived uh, this game, but I know that the Rams had a really late rally, so... That would have been uh, really interesting if the Rams would have came back and um, just taken charge there. Uh, 49ers squeaked by the Redskins, 17-13 to there. Um, there was a late touchdown for the Redskins. I want to say that was by Hyde. Um, uh, I think it was, yeah. I think it was. Uh, really good game there for uh, them, though. And then the Cowboys barely beat the Giants, 31-28. to Cowboys are now 8-3 and five, eight and three on the season, 5-0 and oh, uh, on the road. It's just... Crazy to think about. Cowboys were down by 11 at one point. Um, I really thought my Giants were going to pull that one out. Definitely. Uh, long season. Definitely. So, very interesting game. I mean, kudos to the Cowboys. They're doing something right. But um, very interesting to see. Tonight, the Bills and Jets will be playing uh, at 7 o'clock on CBS. Um, they're going to be playing in Detroit, so it's nice to have them going somewhere else. Um, I still say the Bills are favored to win this one, but um, it'll be really interesting uh, to see, and then the Monday night normal game on ESPN, Ravens and Saints. This should be a really exciting game. The Saints have been struggling a lot this season, but I mean, the Ravens, they've been up and down as well, so it should be a really interesting game to watch. And then looking over at uh, Vol Hoops real quick, the men won their home opener against Texas Southern last week, 70-58. Uh, to 58. Josh Richardson had 19 points, 8 rebounds, and 2 assists there. And the balls were shooting uh, 43%. So, I mean, that's kind of low. But, I mean, for the beginning of the season, not too bad. They shot 25 for 58. So, not bad there. And they will be heading to the Orlando Classic for Thanksgiving. And they will play Santa Clara on Thanksgiving Day at noon on ESPN2. So, make sure you check that out. And the Lady Balls are now 4-0 on the season. They beat Winthrop on Friday 81-48. to Kind of shocking to see because we're so used to them scoring 90 or more points in Definitely. the first three games. But, I mean, Ariel Massengale, 20 Went points, off. zero rebounds, and one assist there from her. But um, the Lady Vols will take on Tennessee State tonight at 7 um, here at Thompson Bowling Arena. So that should be a really interesting matchup. It'll be exciting to see how many points Lady Vols put up tonight. But, I mean, Definitely. can't really look past Tennessee State. I mean, They're we don't really – They are really decent. We don't hear much about them, but, I mean – they're fun to watch. I've watched some of their games, and they're pretty exciting. And why not come out and cheer on the Lady Vols? Get a nice student section there tonight, 7 o'clock. I mean, it's a Monday night. Come out watch the Lady mm -hmm. Vols. They're definitely on fire. Massey had like five three-pointers in a row yeah. mm -hmm. against Winthrop the other night. I mean, yeah. you know, there's an exciting team to watch. They're more complete than they have been the last couple of years. Definitely. And so that's it for this week. Next week we'll wrap up uh, the semester while we also wrap up college football. Uh Kind of bittersweet, but it's been an exciting season, exciting semester, so make sure you, you join us next week.